Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 175, Let Your Hair Down, AMA, and a long-awaited review of Charterstone. I'm Sean, and here with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, working with you to make your game nights better. We record these episodes live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, and it would be awesome if you joined us. And thank you to those of you who are here. Now, tonight, we're taking it easy with a live AMA. That's going to be followed with a detailed review of Charterstone, where I share my thoughts on this legacy campaign game after finishing a full campaign, as well as seeing how our now unique copy of the game plays now that the campaign's done. After that, we've got our usual weekend review, including our first play of a new-to-us Stefan Feld game, Revolution of 1828. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Up first, a quick comment from Ryan Metzler. Played Garinto today. Was great. Awesome to see someone else sold on this great abstract strategy game. Seriously, people, go pick this up. Now, I can't offer you a promo code anymore. That was only good for May. The core game is pretty cheap on Amazon right now. Next up, Richard, Richard Eva commented on our topic of epic solo fantasy games to say... Came here hoping to see you talk about Too Many Bones, mm. as I can't decide whether to buy it. But it was still so great to see two of my absolute favorite solo games, Gloomhaven and Mage Knight. Well, thanks, Richard. Um, I have to say Too Many Bones does appeal to me. Now, I first saw it at Origins back in 2017 and went back to see how it evolved in 2019. And at that point, I actually got intimidated and was no longer interested. Uh, there's just so much content out for that game, and it is not at all cheap. While I do admit it looks amazing, neoprene mats with holes cut out of them to fit custom dice and so many custom dice, and there's more custom dice in that game than Dice Master's dice at this point. And of course, the Chip Theory game's um, signature poker chips, right? That's what they're called, Chip Theory, is all their games use actual weighted poker chips, and they use them for about everything. Like, I get it. I totally understand the cost, but I just couldn't justify it to get everything I wanted. Yeah, I'm sure I probably could have walked out of there with just a core box, but who wants just the core box when you're in a booth surrounded by people with all of these boxes everywhere looking like they're going to fall on top of you? Now, from what I've heard, the game probably does belong on our list of epic solo games. It really does look like an epic experience, and it looks like due to all those boxes, there is plenty of content. Now, what I think we need to happen is we need Chip Theory to send us a copy to review. You hear that, Chip Theory? We're here. I'll do an unboxing review. It'll get released in video, audio, as well as written. Then we can put it on the list. We like to note that we will share your comments, positive or negative. So here's one from Frank Rash about our article on ugly games that play great. Today, I don't think there's an excuse to make board games look bad, even budget. Having said that, many games on that list don't look nearly as bad as the article reads. Oh, uh, harsh. Well, thanks for the comment, Frank. Um, honestly, this is one of the first complaints I've gotten about my writing, and I did confirm with Frank he met it how it reads. Um, he thought the article was way uglier than the game. So I'm not sure exactly what he took offense to. Um, I think it was more about the games I choose to talk about and why I choose to talk about them, not how I did. Uh, hopefully it wasn't the writing that offended you. I know D did proofread that one, so it shouldn't have my usual spelling and grammar mistakes. But I guess to each your own. Um, if anyone else has a problem with that article, please let me know. If I need to rewrite it, maybe I'll go through it again and see if I can word things a little better. All right, well, Thursday we republished an older article about great games to bring camping, and that got a bit of feedback. First with Keith, was Keith J. Davies, who commented, so, not an acrony? No, Keith, not an acrony. And then Dan Prans wrote, great article. Having a bunch of gaming kids and a love of camping, I will certainly check some of these out. One thing I would like to add is co-op games. I find kids can be tired and a bit irritable at times. Games where they all win together and or lose together have been a great camping addition for us. Specifically, Forbidden Desert and Forbidden Island have been a lot of fun. Often, I see them playing and teaching other kids from the campground. Happy camping. Well, thanks for that, Dan. Um, now, normally, I'd like to complain about the tins in the Forbidden games. All three, Forbidden Island, Forbidden Desert, and 
I can't even remember what the last one's called, all come in metal tins. And I hate them normally. I hate putting them on my shelves. I hate transporting them. But I got to say, these would be great for camping, right? Especially if it starts pouring rain. They're going to protect your games way better than any traditional boxes. Now, as for gameplay, I can totally see these games working great while camping. But I will admit, my family doesn't actually enjoy them for some reason. Now, I don't know exactly what's wrong with those games, why they don't play. I just I don't think there's quite enough meat to them, whatever it is. But I do know others that love the Forbidden series and enjoy them greatly. So I think they're very solid recommendations. And Ryan in the chat room mentions Forbidden Sky. That's the third one. That That one no one talks about. And that one's got like electricity where you're trying to power up a ship. I actually want to try that one, but I haven't had a chance. Well, finally, a comment from Snethus on our Discover Lands Unknown unboxing that went live on Monday. Mm -hmm. This game was way better than the reviews. People had expectations of a legacy narrative game, but instead it's a real solid exploration game. It's worth picking up a few of these if you can get them cheap. Well, thanks, Ness. Uh, At this point, we have played the first game, and I've got to agree the exploration aspect is really well done. Like you really do get that feeling of feeling lost and not sure what to do or where you should go next and being all worried about the basics like food and water. And it's actually quite impactful. Like you, you, that definitely involves some emotions you don't normally get from a board game. Now, I'm still personally a little concerned about later games, especially once you've got like game one uses one set of scenery, game two uses the other set of scenery. Once you get to game three, you're back to using that first set again. And that worries me because at that point, you probably already explored everything, but I haven't gotten that far yet. So I will say we did really enjoy the first game, though at this point, I'm not rushing out to get another copy, but it could be interesting. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. A quick reminder before we get to the AMA. Our Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion giveaway is still going strong. As of right now, while we're recording this, not when it goes live, there are 14 days left to enter. And while we've got a solid number of entries, and I've been impressed by the numbers, there's still really good odds out there. They're not so high that you don't even have a chance. Uh, So we've got one sealed copy of this Coded Chronicles game that we are willing to ship to anywhere in the continental U.S. and Canada. Sorry, those of you overseas shipping. It's killing all of us. To enter, all you got to do is head over to the blog, check out the pin post, or follow the link I'll be tossing in the show notes. Good luck. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. And tonight, we're going to be answering those questions live. Technically, we're always live, but we don't get the questions live. We do research and we prepare. Instead, we're just going to be going right off the tip of our tongues or on our toes. Keep us on our toes. Because right now, it's that time of year where there's just a lot going on. Uh, exams are coming up for my kids and they're stressing out over that. One of my kids' uh, glasses broke today and I tried to fix them and that didn't go well. Uh, The spring festivals here in Windsor have started, as they like to call the unofficial start of summer. Uh, Concerts are happening again and my daughter's been performing in a couple. And also non-critical medical procedures are starting to happen again here in Ontario. And for me at least, this means uh, bringing my mom, myself, and other family members out to doctors quite often. And at this point, it feels like we have something, and in most days, two to three things that we need to get to that is kind of interfering with all the game plan and talk about games and blog writing and stuff like that. And apparently no one ever told my industry to slow down. So aside from production shortages... (laughs) Yeah, you've been way busier than you ever used to be. It's a little crazy. So, sorry, a a little bonkers. Now, due to all this hubbub, I want to use tonight's show as a bit of a break, a chance to let my hair down, relax a bit, have a couple coffees, which I may have to get a refill before we get too far into this, and hang out and chat with you awesome folk in our lobby, and, you know, maybe answer some gaming questions, since that's what we're actually here for. My hair is always down, since I haven't worn it up in about 25 years since it was halfway (laughs) down my back. It still counts. It's it's, it's down in a way. The beard's down. I don't know. I don't know. (laughs) So to get the conversation started and to give everyone in the chat, now's your chance. Start getting your questions in. Um, I've got a question for Sean, who I know has been reading a ton more superhero books with more on the way, including sharing some pictures online of his, uh, his most recent parking lot reading and so on. So Sean, as of right now, what's the best superhero game you found for your style of play? And why is it the best? What makes it work for you? 
Well, I mean, for me, I think people have to really understand. And the way I'm looking at games personally for me is how I play. And that is not only online, but it tends to be online asynchronous. Right. So we aren't getting together on, uh, you know, a voice and video chat all at the same time and playing for four mm-hmm. hours with a VTT or even a whiteboard. Uh, generally speaking, we're playing more like a uh, play by post almost uh, from, okay. from back in the day. But in a little more real time, a little more real time than that due to the flexibility of Discord. Uh, so as a result, uh, dice are just kind of annoying. Um, so the more crunch you get, the more interference you get, the less uh, the less ability to free play and, and narrate, because, you know, if every if every time someone acts, you need to roll dice that mm. really puts a, uh, a skids on the things. As a result, uh, so far for me, masks has really been just kept <laughs> keeps ending up okay. being the one. Um, I, I I tried to go somewhere else, and we came back to masks because it's just uh, well known, it's flexible, and there aren't that many roles. Uh, if you know, as long as everyone knows what they're doing, and 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 you're not helping people play, we've got a, a couple of experienced groups of players now, uh, and so you can really just kind of let loose and. The rolling comes naturally as it is, and you know you suggest what you need to roll. The DM jumps in, you roll it, and everyone moves on. Uh, and the wonders with the wonders of Discord, the ability to thread things uh, has been fantastic. So, so one question I do have, and I know we don't like to talk too negatively about games on here. What other games did you try that you end up going back to masks on? Like you tried something else, went you know what that doesn't quite work, and now we went back. Yeah, uh, it was. Um, I'm trying to remember now. It was the adventure one. I'm trying to remember the name of it now. Uh, amazing, amazing heroes. Uh, but it, the the problem with it was it was a single. What was the Imagine system. story system? Right? Yeah, that was the mechanics. And so it was it was fine. And I think at a table, especially with a younger crowd, it's a really good game. The problem we were having is all of us as players and as a dm really prefer the bell curve um right you you want that aspect of the heroes are gonna be you know come out better more often than not uh and masks allows that where the amazing stories one was a single role no curve uh and so the randomness just kind of stuck out a little bit more uh possibly Mm -hmm. because we'd been used to playing a bell curve system Right. But uh, yeah, that really kind of uh, impacted the, the kind of stories we were telling. All right. Got some questions to follow up from the chat. Uh, why do you prefer to play that way, Sean? Why do you prefer playing online? Just time availability? Uh, it's the groups of people I've run in with. Uh, basically, all the people who I have hooked up with and play are we have a number of different time zones and things. So uh, while we do occasionally all kind of sync up and play in a more real-time uh method it's all still done through discord chats and it's just how we all lined up and hooked, connected together now when it started it was play by form wasn't it like intentionally uh some yeah some of the game I, i've been yeah i mean we go you can all go all the way back to you know aim and you know, all the you know icq and all all the different uh no but like you're you playing supers games online that started with a play by forum mask did it not uh well no it starts way longer than that before pre (laughs) way pre masks no i mean i have been uh i've been playing superhero games online in one form or another um since i guess post university so it was uh modern internet but uh okay again it was one of those things where i played a little bit of D in university but very little and then mm-hmm. i get, went into a giant uh sort of lack of any role play um uh, you know i wasn't back right. in Windsor, so i wasn't playing with you at all other than you know the occasional time i managed to get down and, and play a single game uh and i was just really craving rpgs and, and i found some you know super fans and and some games uh popped up and I just kind of kept going with that with that. So all right. Sounds good. Another follow-up question from Jeff. Have you tried City of Mist yet? Uh I'm trying to remember what City of Mist is. Uh so I'm gonna say no. Oh, that's the cinematic. No, I have not yet. 
I recognize the cover. I know the name. I know yeah. nothing more about City of Mist. No, I have not. At all. It. You haven't tried the Fate one, have you? Fate Core? Centurions, I think it's called? Uh, no. I, the one that I'm I'm sort of looking at. I was looking at that one. Just someone, someone was talking about, it was an interesting side topic, uh, novelizations based on role-playing games. And like, of course, there's there's the D and D novels and everything. And well, someone pointed out there's one based on Fate, and I'm like, there's a Fate novel, and I'm like, wait, I think I got that from back in Fate Core. And when I did, and I looked into it, and I'm like, yeah, sure enough, but it's specifically for this game, Centurions, which looks to be more of a leave the extraordinary gentleman style. Right. Uh, the one I'm I'm uh, sort of really interested in, and I've, they've been dribbling out the content for, is the Superpower Companion for from Pinnacle for Suede. Savage Worlds. Uh, Savage yeah. Worlds Adventure. Uh, so they've been dribbling out content. Just this morning, uh, I got the email saying that all their VTT content is now downloadable and, and usable. Um, but it's like, I honestly have had trouble keeping track of what all they have released and what all they have. And it was a Kickstarter, but they just kind of, you know, hey, come to our site and download this new thing. And you go to their site and there's, 20 different things to download and mm -hmm. i'm not sh the dates are all weird so i'm not even sure what's right to download <laughs> what's new what i haven't what i have already they don't version number very well no. uh, so it's been a bit frustrating i'm kind of just wait mostly waiting to get some hard copy in my hands see I'm, I'm amused by that because uh recently there's a humble bundle deal i think it's on right now actually for starfinder um which i can drop if anyone's interested in starfinder i'll drop a link in the chat uh, a, an affiliate link because why not make us some money right um and you can get basically everything starfinder digital and like i shared this and someone big name in the industry and i'm not going to say who came out and was like i would so love to back this but i hate getting pdfs from paizo because they do the same thing they don't use drive through they don't send them to your email they give you a login code and a password and you have to go to their site and download it and I'm like, you know what? I did that once and I remember it being painful, but it was enough years ago that I just assumed they improved. And from what I'm hearing it, no. <laughs> no, and like the 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 PEG one is not. It's yeah, not it's, good. I, like, I, I, it's probably all using the same software in the back end. That people don't want to rely on third party like drive through, yep. except at the same time, drive through works really well. Their library system and updates mm -hmm. are really smooth. Like yeah. it, it's just it just works and and having another login to re, to deal with if this is 2022 less logins the more better yeah <laughs> uh what else we got here um so pax asks what would you most uh what would you like most to see from designers and publishers in engagement with you both before during and after the review process so this one is uh, is a little hard to answer. So the big thing is just lots of communication up front. And I, I, honest communication, I hate wording it that way. But um, in a perfect world, all the designer and publisher needs to do is go, hey, we are looking for someone to review this game. And then I write them and say, here's what we offer, an unboxing video, a live review on Twitch where it's two talking heads converted to a video review on YouTube, also written up as a blog post. So you get a written review and we release on our podcast. That way people can watch it, listen to it or read it because that's our big thing. And then at that point, that's it. I send them that and they say, it sounds good. And it shows up. And then I expect to get a completed game that I then unbox and we play at least five times and I review it and then we're kind of done. In, in a perfect world, that's how it works. The problem is somewhere along the way, sometimes that breaks down. Now, most common, um, all our patrons just got a, today I sent a behind the scenes note where I was kind of ranting about, about a recent game we were, we were asked to review that we could not review. Um, in a perfect world, that's it. Like the thing, in addition to that, okay, I'm going to jump back a bit. In addition to that, if you want more, tell me. So all I want is more. If that's, I just offer you what we're going to give you. If you want more, tell me. Don't expect anything else other than what I just offered. We're going to unbox it. We're going to play it five times. We're going to review it in three formats. If you want more than that, don't just sit back and expect more than that. I don't care what other reviewers did for you in the past or what you're used to getting. That's what I'm offering. So don't be upset if you don't get it before your Kickstarter launches or if you want it in a week. Or if you wanted the review to feature more actual play shots 
or if you are looking for a live play and not a review, those are not what I offer. So I want clarity of what you are expecting from me. I am telling you what we're offering. If that's not enough, say something. Don't just send the game and then start writing me going, oh, where's your review? I'm like, I'll get to it. I told you I had to play the game five times. That takes time. I'm not going to play it five times in a row. I like to play your game with different groups. Isn't that good for you? So you get the opinion of more than one group. I usually try to hit three different groups of players before I do it in those five plays. If you want me to just get the game, play it once and review it, I can do that. But what I think sets us apart from us, some of the reviewers is that we don't do that, that we actually do give the game a deep dive. Um, an example of that tonight's Charterstone review. The reason it has taken so long is not only did I wait till we finished the campaign, we even tried the game once we were done before I wrote up the review because I wanted to get the full experience. So it's 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 just like we talked about it. Almost all of our board game night advice, anytime we're talking board game night advice is set expectations. I just want the expectations to be set. Don't expect more than what was stated. Um, and if you're asking for a review, Provide us a game that we can review. A preview, you know, in the, well, even a preview, you should be able to play the game. <laughs> if you yeah. if you can't play the game again, we we were we were generous. Um, and if in theory, Hellbringer could have been more problematic because when we sat down with the rule book, we couldn't play the game. Now yeah. with the actual play, there was videos and things where where you could work out what to play, and then we had some wonderful help help of max online yes. but that should not be something that's expected yes. um that that should be something where look we have a game that's you know not ready yet we would like you to preview it uh it's not ready for publication yet mm -hmm. it's a whole different thing but if you say hey i've got a game ready to preview it better be ready oh, to even preview. worse is it ready to review because right. that was not sold to us as a preview it was sold to us a review where we would provide a prototype copy Right. which as far as we knew just meant the physical components weren't finished right now in all fairness max thought his game was done right so i get it in a way but um the, the, like i said it's expectations um if you want a preview call it a preview you cannot review an unfinished game because it's no longer review as soon as something changes whatever we said about it could be completely false and wrong by the time the game's published that's why it's not a review. Like technically you could kind of say it's a snapshot of the review that is in this part of the progress or whatever of the design. But in real reality, that's preview. Now I do know a lot of people realize that um, think that preview means paid preview. That is not the case. We have at this point not charged for any of this. Yeah, no, absolutely. We don't, uh, we don't, we have not yet charged anyone for the previews, but no. we also don't provide the full video fancy. Well, exactly. Which is, again, companies. something I've had people who expect that. Again, if I'm offering you an unboxing video and a review in three formats, that's what you should expect to get. Um, and like I said, I, and I'm, we're willing to do more. And I've mentioned it before. I think we're probably going to try to be done with previews. It's not something we're going to continue doing, or we're going to work up a fee schedule. Because so far, every single preview we have done I have ended up being an unpaid play tester, developer, sometimes editor, and every single one, because I am the type of reviewer that when I get a game and it doesn't make sense, I'm going to reach out and say, hey, this doesn't work. How is it supposed to work? And so many times I get written back going, oh, I didn't realize it was a problem. Here, try this. Here, try that. As soon as you're saying, here, try this, here, try that, I'm now a developer for your game. I'm even a play tester because you're asking me to try out new rule variations. Yeah. I mean, we have talked about this in episodes past. You need to blind play test your game yes and and that was the the clear missing component here i mean yes it's fantastic that max knows how his game works max yep. can teach anyone his game and it turned out we actually liked the game mm -hmm. but unless max is going to come with every box of hellbringer you yes. buy there needs until to be we're some... at the point where you get the max hologram <laughs> to teach you the game there there needs to be some uh some better rule management there and there were language issues and it seems yeah. like uh the translator may have missold him on what they Their were able to, to do who knows we don't know we don't know yeah. all the background stuff but uh whatever the result was it was out of the box an unplayable game i am your emergency game night hologram please state the nature <laughs> of the board game night emergency I'm <laughs> totally picturing like Max showing up to teach you the game. There you go. You're gonna put Rodney Smith out of out of business. 
<laughs> you're going to show up and you're just going to load the game hologram. It's going to teach you how to play. Um, but yeah, now one of the things that I do is I will ask for clarification. Um, honestly, the, this may sound bad. Maybe we've sold out whatever you want to call it, but I hate doing reviews where we get nothing out of it. And in these preview cases, sometimes that's literally what we get. Like, I don't even have a copy of the game. I have to send it back so we can send it to another reviewer. I have literally nothing to show for it except the content we put out. And that's it. And basically, we're working for, um, what do you call it? Exposure <laughs> at that point, right? Like, that's basically what we're doing. Now, with board game bigger companies, usually I at least get a copy of the game. Not much payment. What I look for now is something that we can then sell after in the form of affiliate links. So when someone's like, we have a finished game, we're going to send it to you. I now find out, can I buy that game on Amazon? Can I get it at Game Nerds? Can I download the RPG off drive through? Is there somewhere I can provide links to people where we at least get a bit of a kickback? Now, again, depending on the game, if the game's a big enough game and the value of the game is enough, then it's not that bad. But if it's some little small $15 card game, um, I don't want to name names. I was trying to decide on some of the ones that are out. But there, there's a bunch of smaller games that we reviewed. I'm probably going to say no to more of those. Or again, work out a fee schedule. The difference is once we start doing fees, then we have to disclose a lot more. We don't, we currently always admit when we get a review copy, but I don't put up the YouTube, this is a paid promotion because we were not still cash exchanged hands. Once cash exchanges hands, we have to start putting that up. And then there you get into the whole worry of people about our credibility at that point. Now, I really don't think it's going to be a problem. I think we've now established over the last three and a half years how fair we can be about a game. But it then becomes another thing to another concern of ours. Yep. No, it's so, it's it's a it's a strange thing um because essentially, you know, everyone's like, oh well, you get a copy of the game. Well, that's great. But if it's a twenty dollar game and we've spent two, three hours writing reviews, another couple hours taking and editing pictures another hour or so editing up the video and posting the video, and then all the time that they spent promoting and tweeting and publishing the reviews, you're looking at, you know, let's, let's say for a small, easy game, you know, doesn't take much time, easy to get five plays out of, card, you know, comes in a tuck box, uh, 10 to 12 hours. Yeah. At $25. In 10 to 12, about 12 hours for three people, for three people, <laughs> that's not a lot of money. No. Um, that's not even, you know, I, I, there are, there are probably some African company countries where that is minimum wage. Mm. Um, but <laughs> it's also a lot cheaper. To like buy I, said, I, I, I hate to sound greedy. Like, yes, we do this for fun and we do it for the love of gaming. And, and our goal is to make everyone's game night better, but it has to be worth doing or else we just can't do this. And exactly. Yeah, there, there's, there are paying jobs that will actually allow us to put food on the table, yes. uh, but not do the same, spend these, this amount of time doing the reviews. Right. Uh, it's one or the other, essentially. So Yeah, in a way, yeah, pretty much. So yeah, mainly it's, it, I, I will now go out and go, is your game finished? Um, is it completely finished? And then I'll clarify, is it really finished? Like, are the rules complete? Um, will, where can I get your game is now a question I will ask, um, wh where can I get my game? And for all these Kickstarter previews, it's always, where am I, where are people going to be able to buy the game once Kickstarter is done? As soon as they say Kickstarter exclusive, I'm now getting nothing out of this. I, I am giving you clout and attention and I am getting to preview a game. Now, usually with Kickstarters, I will make a deal to get a copy of the finalized game. And if the game's big enough, that might be enough. At least it's something again, at least it's something. But like I said, previews were probably done. I, I will fully admit here, I did say it to our patrons earlier today that, that I, I am, it's going to be very rare that I accept a preview of a game, like I said, until we possibly sit down and, and decide on some kind of fee schedule for it. And then we'll start producing advertisement. But then we get into the whole people, they don't like us saying anything negative, they're now paying for it, and do they get the right to edit and all that other fun stuff. I kind of don't want to go there. So Jeff is mentioning that Rodney Smith would be DLC, the four ninety nine Rodney Smith skin for Game Night Hologram. There you go. If you prefer Paul Grogan, you could also get Paul, and you know you can get some Becca Scott going. That's the the Geek and Sundry bonus pack. There you go. <laughs> uh, all righty. Uh, so Tex asking, I noticed you played Azul again recently. Are you still really impressed with it? 
impressed isn't really the right word anymore. Like, like it's, it's past the point of impressing me, but it's still a really solid game. Um, now, what I will admit is we're mostly playing online. Um, Sean, Dan, and I have an ongoing Azul game now that kind of replaced. Remember for months there, we were always playing Seven Wonders. Now we're always playing Azul. And what I like is in the last while, we've switched to using the backside of the board, which I just find way more, I don't know why, way more interesting, Absolutely. way more engaging. No, I'm, I definitely agree. There's a, there's a lot more thought to it. It's yeah. really easy to not quite pay enough attention or jump ahead of what uh, in your own planning and put something in there that completely messes you down the road. Yep. Um, so yeah, we've been, we've been playing that a lot online. We did play in person too. Um, we had one of the nights cat and Tori were over. We broke it out. I still like it. Um, I, I have no problems with, with Azul. I still like Azul. I will note that we're playing the original, even though I've said before, I prefer Sintra. Well, or not Sintra, sorry, Sintra. summer pavilion. <laughs> I, my copy of Summer Pavilion and Sintra haven't been touched and well since Sean was down in Windsor like pre COVID when we were playing in easy mode right. was the last time those came out. So yeah, still digging as well. Azul's a great game. Um and like I said, I'm I'm kind of surprised because like if you ask me and I'm like, which do you prefer? I'd mention the other one, but what do I play? I play the original. Yeah, and I, I none of us have still seen the newest one. So no. uh and I've heard good things about it, but we have yet to I, see I have heard it is heavy. Like like heavy, heavy. Like, oh, okay. like like blows away Sintra. Sintra seems simple compared to it. Oh wow. Which I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. Yeah, no, part of the part of the fun of Azul is the the not brainless, but you know, that coffee shop conversation mm -hmm. as you play. Um, yeah, where, whereas I'm pretty think. sure the new one, you're you're focusing on yeah, your game. So you need to be able to think in Azul, but you don't have to spend hundred percent of your time focused uh, throughout that game. Um that's and that and the 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 digital version is great. I mean, I, I have to say the BGA mm -hmm. has done a fantastic job implementing the original Azul. I I can't really find any fault with it at all, honestly. No, there's nothing. The, the scoring is a little obscure, but once you play it on BGA, yeah, <laughs> it does all that for you. You may not get why. So Ryan asked, uh, "Did your Seven Wonders play include cities and or leaders?" No, none of that was on the the BGA version. It was just it was the new version, the the second edition of Seven Wonders, which is tweaked a bit, and honestly does seem a little better. Like well, I was enjoying. Be, and actually, it wasn't when we first started playing. It was still first, and then it, uh, yeah, it at swapped. some point it swapped over and confused all of us. Yeah, and it was hard <laughs> at first because it felt like you didn't have enough resources. But I actually prefer the new edition. Um, if I loved the game, I would replace my copy with the new version. But I don't love it enough to do that myself. Plus, we get kind of sick of it playing so many. But no, there were no expansions online. As far as I know, they still haven't added any. Yeah, a little I, I haven't checked in ages. Uh, I made my big mistake of accidentally clicking OK, I'll play again for Deus. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which that's, I mean, that's another one we should add on the list to play when you're down here, though I'd have to reread the rules. because I mean, I, it's not hard. I mean, it's straightforward. I just I'm not really enjoying it, I guess. So <laughs> I don't know. Deus, Deus uh, is one of those games that's on my shelf. And the if I had time, I would give it one more shot. Like I would make this a podcast segment. I would call it, oh, you want to hit me with your last shot or something. Right give me your last shot, whatever. And then we would play out, play it. And then I would decide keep it or get rid of late it. And I would out. let everyone know. Late huh? checkout. Late checkout. There you go. I don't know. <laughs> whatever we're going to call it. It's, it's like last chance, right? Like yeah. uh, get, get booted. And we're I would totally do that. But like, uh, hmm? I, I love that. We're calling down for a late checkout for our, yeah. this game. So there you go. Does so it, yeah, it, we may have a new segment. Or is it out the door? <laughs> yeah. Does it get late checkout or does it, does it get to stay an additional late or is it the room upgrade? No yeah. room upgrades. What no. we use for a, that's your bot. Yeah, I keep forgetting about going. clans. Yes, you I got to do, do that damn block sensor build. I forgot about it again. I don't even know where the insert is. It's not where it sat for months. All right. Uh, another question. So, so that was a good one. Pax, uh, is, uh, Pax's husband is reading Pillars of the Earth right now. Mm -hmm. And I know you shield deals on that game and it's well regarded. Have you ever played that box that I know you have in your basement? Because oh, I yeah. can picture where it yep. is on the shelves. Fantastic game. Uh, it's it's a you don't need to know the books. Um, it almost inspired me to read the books, but I didn't because there's they're thick and there's a bunch of them. So I didn't get into it. Um, has the best um, physical timing mechanism I've seen in a game because every round you build more of the cathedral and the cathedral is made of wood and you literally add chunks until the full cathedral is built, which looks really neat. Um, it is very much a engine building game. It's a start off by finding a way to start getting bricks. All right, now that you've got bricks, find a way to start turning your bricks 
into to um or whatever and start getting clay all right find a way to get your bricks turned or your clay turned into bricks now that you've got bricks start building windows and stuff like that and you're trying to get a progression hiring characters from the novels to break the rules as well as hiring generic like builders types and like you know the person the glazier who makes glass and whatever the best part about that game is it has a very unique initiative system don't delete stuff i'm not i'm, not, I'm gonna need it for the show notes no, no, I'm not. Okay, thought I saw something vanish. No, just... Like, I need to know, otherwise I got to listen to every damn word we say. <laughs> so the best thing in that game is there is a very unique, I call it an initiative system. So you put all your workers into a bag. It's the Pillars of the Earth from, um, oh, I'm trying to blank on, Ken Follett is the one who wrote yeah, the novels. Ken Follett's Pillars of the Earth. Um, there's also something, End of the World, Edge of the World. That one wasn't as good. I have both. I never, yeah. it's it's part two of the series whatever it's called end of the earth it might be end of the earth end of the world it's also can fall it anyway you put all everyone's workers in the bag and you pull them out and then you can use it but the first one to come out costs more money so you're like i can pay to go first or i can put my guy aside but i'm gonna go after everyone that paid so like i get one of my guys and i'm like oh i can't afford it i don't have the money so i put him aside and then I pull another one. I pull myself again. And I'm like, oh, Jesus. Okay, fine. I don't go. And then you pull another one. And Sean, Sean's like, oh, yeah, I'll play. I'll go first. And the next one comes out. And it's D. And D's like, yeah, yeah, I'll go. And then it, then mine finally comes up. I'm like, okay, I would like to go at least third. you know. And you pull them out in this little thing. And they go on the stained glass window to show the player order. That's amazing. Like, I like that system enough. I really thought it would show up again. Because this is not a new game. This is like an old, like we were playing this when we were playing Catan and Carcassonne and Power Grid, right? It's in that early 2000s era. Really so, solid uh, game. World without end. World without. I knew there were worlds and ends involved. World without end. World without end is not as good. It's it's a solid Euro, but it feels dated. Pillars of the Earth does feel like one of those older, early 2000s Euros, but there's enough neat little things in there. But it's very much a Euro. You're, you're not, you don't feel like you're building a cathedral. You don't feel like you're involved in the novels. You don't get to know the characters. You're just playing a Euro worker placement game and getting the most glory or fame or whatever they give you or contributing the most to the, the cathedral. Yep. But yeah. Worth picking up. Worth, we're checking out, especially with deals. It was out of print for a long time and going for ridiculous money for a long time. And then um, I think it's cosmos was like, we're finally going to put it back out in the market. Everyone was like, Oh my God, it's back in the market. But I think they overproduced it and overestimated the number of fans who were looking for copies in between. Uh, and there is an expansion set for that as well. Yeah, that I do not have. So, I think uh, it's one of those smaller, like Queenie style expansions. So the but... original printing was two thousand and six. Yeah, see? Uh, and two the twenty eighteen was the most recent printing. Uh, and again, it might start becoming hard to find again. Seven. So, this is another one that I think may become hard to find again. Oh, and actually, the the expansion cards are only good for the Mayfair games and Philosophy. So the original printing only. So So the new edition, you can't use. I guess they must. They must have changed the quality then. Yeah, that's Uh, interesting. Mine mine is the original printing. Like I said, probably bought in two thousand six, two thousand seven, back then. I say it kind of feels like that time period. But if you enjoy those drier euros, I think you'll like it. Right. Okay. Well, coming up, uh, we got sort of two parter here from Ryan. Uh, To date, what tabletop belltop projects have been more successful than expected and which ones have been less so or just failed to pan out? Well, the second part of that one is really... Yeah, I know know the second (laughs) one. We've answered that one on an AMA before. Maybe we can come up with something more recent because that's been a long time. I don't know, more successful than expected? I don't know. Like we've had specific episodes do way better than we thought they would. And I've had certain blog posts stick out. Like, I can't believe people aren't sick of two-player games. I still get <laughs> asked about two-player games. Um, I actually I actually was very tempted to steal a meme off the internet and do best tea time games because of uh, the Gale thread. That might actually be our topic next week. I may steal that one. Best tea time games, which are games that for two players to play under half an hour that you play while having your tea. Not that we have tea, but <laughs> we've done two-player games, but I don't think we've done less than half-hour ones and ones you can play over having tea, so... We may steal that topic next week. Two yeah, player it's got to be light enough to play, but because it's your first tea of the morning is the yes. is the key. Yes, so. the first tea of your which most people replying to that thread didn't read. 
<laughs> and it drove me nuts. People trying to tell me I can play Power Grid in half an hour when I first get up. Yeah. And Pandemic sure. Legacy. What? <laughs> yeah, sure. Why not? Sure. Let's let's fit in 24 games uh, in half I, an hour. I would say, I mean, for as, as sort of more expected or more successful than expected, I'm actually reasonably happy with uh, the brunch. I, it hasn't been like overwhelmingly fantastic we haven't you know garnered a whole yeah new, we didn't blow up or anything we haven't garnered a whole new uh set of people but you know there's enough people out there who are enjoying it and we generally get a little bit of con a little bit of back and forth uh on mm -hmm. on the sundays and uh you know people have said that they like what we're doing so you know as far as i'm concerned that's kind of good enough i'm not, we're not real go. picky there's one thing that that is doing better than i thought it would and doing rather well is uh that most people probably don't even know we do and that is as an Amazon influencer. Yes, I'm an Amazon influencer. It's actually a thing you can become. Um, I upload our unboxing videos to Amazon. And when you go to buy games, there's a chance you'll be able to see my videos over on the side or somewhere. I don't even know where they put them, to be honest. And there are some of those that are performing way better than anything we put out. Well, not way better than anything, because the dang Gloomhaven there. The one thing that was more successful than I expected is the yeah. Gloomhaven FAQ that's still getting hits. <laughs> that's going to be a forever thing. I don't think we'll ever top that. But yeah, it's this thing where I upload videos and I upload a thumbnail and I put it in a short description and it goes on Amazon and it sits there. And what I like about it is it's 100% passive income. Once I've uploaded the video, no one can comment on it. I don't have to go check things. I don't have to thumbs up and reply to people. It just, it's there and I get paid people watch it. It doesn't pay well, but it mm -hmm. still pays. And that has been as slowly going up, like the amount people are watching and the amount we make off it. But like most people wouldn't even know I'd have this. Like you can technically go to my influencer page and see all the videos I've uploaded as well as we also, uh, I don't maintain them, but we also have lists of board game deals on there where I used to every day go update it. So there was always a list of the games on sale. We now do that on the webpage instead um, go, go because to more people see it. Com rather than Amazon. Yes. Yeah, so that people go to <laughs> tabletop L up, say Amazon. Um, so there are those there too, but I don't really do that. That's, that was the start of the influencer thing which actually panned out really well when it started, which was, I was still working then. Like we weren't even tabletop bellhop at that time. I was Windsor gaming and I shared deals there to help buy more games. That's all that was. So yeah, that the, the Amazon influencer program has worked out pretty well. Um, what they're now allowing is live videos. And I've been trying to figure out what the heck and why, or if it's worth it, like having me sit there and talk about some game with affiliate links or it's, review it like we are here. It's very much a, um, you know, it's, it's an network. influencer, influencer, it's thing, shopping, not home, shopping home network type thing. Content yeah. is what I think they're looking for on the live. So just like that, you know, it's, it's just like what we're seeing now. by, I don't even know. Oh, Sean's already got it. Um, yeah. So, so I don't know. I kind of looked into it a bit, but I'm like, I don't know. I could easily sit here and talk about some game if it would actually pan out to, to work well, Yep. but I haven't followed it up. Um, stuff that failed, obviously the, the, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, well, the I express. can't remember. Yes, yeah, so the Tabletop Bellhop Express. We've mentioned it before. Yeah, I have no idea. That was a ton of effort and zero, like zero. Yeah, pretty much. Reward. Nobody watched it. Nobody commented on it. Nobody cared. Yeah, uh, and we spent a chunk, a, a significant chunk of time in a short time frame trying yes. to get it turned around to do it, and it just was, it was basically take nothing. everything we're talking about tonight and cut it down to fifteen minutes and re-record it, and then just add me. all the you know, and add then all the Sean was adding video and everything else. And... So I don't know, I, I that but that was a while ago. I'm trying to think of stuff that hasn't panned out recently. Um, trying to live stream anything other than this yeah all of our live streams have been like, like i've tried live streaming like playing the paranoia rpg because well paranoia rpg is um it is based on the pen and paper we tried live stream we were playing star wars the old republic which i know it's an older game but some people like to watch people play older games i think part of the problem is this the the video game streamers um have a certain like they, they're they're regular it's always the same time every day yeah. they have the followers they're constantly hey, in three hours i'm going online what am i going to be playing tonight they're constantly talking on their socials about their streaming mm -hmm. and we weren't doing that because it wasn't our focus ever no. um and and so i think i think stream the the big streamers tend to just constantly put that content out there and their followers grow to expect that so if you're not following in that path 
you're not getting the kind of stream viewers. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's is what it but is. Like not, like we weren't even getting one or yeah. two viewers. Like it just no one cared. Yeah. So that didn't really pan out, but that wasn't like a big plan. It was just kind of one of those, hey, we're playing these video games together anyway. Why don't we stream it and see if we get people? Maybe, maybe that'll get us some some people who will then come back and care about the other stuff. Part of the, and part of the stuff with that is when there's nobody there, it's hard to keep up a patter, right? Well, you need yeah. to be talking to the chat. And if you have no idea if there's anyone there or if you suspect or know that there is zero people there, it's hard to keep up that chat. So that when someone comes in, they're left with you know just watching us just play. watching you play and not that interaction which is what drives mm-hmm. a lot of twitch right it's it's not on not even the game it's the personality behind the player that's uh that's driving it uh the other thing that never took off are the wish lists i really thought like deanna was really pushing that we make like i'll admit they haven't been updated forever but wish lists for most like mommy bloggers and brand bloggers are huge and we tried like i did i don't even remember I, we have like four or five different wish lists and like you do them in like April so that they're live by the time Christmas and Google's already been able to fully SEO them. So they're showing up in page rank and then you should see a big boost in the holiday system or holiday system, sorry, holiday season. And that never, never really took off. Like, I don't, I don't know. It's the way I wrote them, what they're about. Gamers don't care. Like, like the Amazon deals do us well. That's totally different. Like boxing day sales, but I'm just talking about like, Hey, here's a wish list of stuff to get people like we've got one on board game blink. Here's things you can pick up to improve your game. I've got one about replacing your paper money in your games with something better. Um, there's one for game masters, there's one for prototypers, whoever's making board games. Like maybe I just need to do wish lists that are just here's the best games this season. But it just feels like there's already a lot of those out there. So I was trying to angle for something people hadn't covered. And like they do okay. I can see like now and then I'm like, oh, we had a rash of sales of blank playing cards, blank dice, and dry erase, uh, whatever, standees. I'm like, someone obviously checked out my article, but it's never really exploded where we we actually thought that would be like heavy gift guides. Gift guide, yes. Yeah, sorry, gift guide is what I was saying. Yeah, Deanna's right. Not wish list, gift guides. Um, so, uh, so as a sort of follow-up, I guess that was already sort of two questions, but, uh, yeah. are there any bell- tabletop bellhop projects in the pipeline? I don't know. I just, I swear there's less, I, as you get older, I realize your time sense changes. I'm like, there's so many things. I'm like, we need to get this done and we need to get that done. We need to get that done. Throwing something new in the mix just seems impossible at this point. Well, I mean, I should, we should say that we have started the process on merch. Uh, there were yes. some, you know floods and things in ottawa that slowed things down but uh yes we we have that that is the next thing probably merch having merch is there um dan and i need to sit down and get back to offering some form of product i I realize that sounds like bad industry (laughs) words and we sold out but we we have uh we've switched newsletter providers and we now have integrated our newsletters so that it can D would know all these terms or whatever. Work with our lead magnet so our tripwire will be more effective or whatever. Um, I started taking the courses D took so I can kind of see stuff. Um, you've seen a little bit of that. Like I now changed um, changed our intro to say working with you to make your game nights better instead of striving to make everyone's game night better, which is vague and doesn't help you. So that was a that was a brand change to make it more interesting. Um, so that's kind of still there in the background. Uh... All right. So yeah, merch is coming. Merch is coming. Um, as for new content, like I keep saying, I need to do TikTok like that. That's the big thing now. Instagram, I don't know what's happening. I, and I, I'm not the only one to complain about this, but we went from getting 500 likes on our pictures I shared to 50. Like, Inst- like Instagram literally. Is, Instagram yeah. is nose diving hard. Yeah. Like one tenth the interaction we used to have. Yeah. Um, it's going to be a 15 ounce bellhop mug, actually, 15. So big enough to hit the. The highest setting on your Keurig, but not quite 16. It's going to be a 15 ounce month. That is determined. Which, uh, yeah, we would still love to know if anyone wants any particular type of merch because our, our merch provider is like, hit me with whatever you want. Like, we can probably figure something out. All right. Uh, doubles his dice cup. There you go. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Interestingly, just sort of ba- jumping back a little bit to what we were talking about earlier, Azul has replaced Carcassonne as the number one ongoing I played hope. game on board game arena wow um by almost double <laughs> so i guess people weren't as in love with carcassonne they just needed an alternative <laughs> I, I, carcassonne it's like seven wonders it's old yeah it's old 
Um, so as usual, you can always find us here at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop on Wednesday nights. Um, feel free to send in your questions ahead of time for doing an AMA and all the usual stuff. Um, if anyone has any last minute questions, we can answer it. Mine's going to be what coffee am I going to drink next, but I'm going to grab randomly for a box. So I don't even know the answer to that. Well, that's it for, for tonight's AMA. We've been aiming to do one of these live Q&A periods about every other month. So expect another one in August. Now remember, you don't have to wait for an AMA. We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions every week. You got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop or fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. And at this point, I'm going to say, please, please send in those questions because we are actually at the point where I need to ask you to send in questions. We are actually getting very low on our question pile. Like we're going to have to start making up our own questions. And you may not like that because it'd be like, I don't know, what, what color do you like your orcs, Sean, green or red? <laughs> All righty. Hello and welcome to our detailed review of Charterstone. Thanks, Jamie of Stonemeyer Games, for sending us a review copy of Charterstone to check out. So Charterstone was designed by Jamie Stegmeyer, features artwork from Lena Cassette and Dave Forrest, graphic design by Christine Santana, and a solo mode developed by Morton Monrad Henderson and David J. Studley. It was originally published by Stonemeyer Games in 2017, and is still readily available and in print at the time we are doing this review. Now, Charterstone is a campaign game for one to six players, with each game taking around an hour, with some games going longer and a couple going shorter. Now, this legacy game has an MSRP of $80 US. Note, for the majority of this review, we will be doing our best not to spoil anything about Charterstone and its campaign. That said, Due to the amount of content that gets unlocked while you are playing and the way uh, the way the rules change over time, we'll be including some information about later aspects of the game, but saving them for the end of tonight's review. So you'll easily be able to skip ahead if you want. Now, Charterstone is a legacy style campaign game where each player takes control of one of six charters in a newly founded fantasy city. Each game, players will compete for points and honor while trying to develop their own charter, as well as trying to meet a scenario-specific goal. While building their charters, players will build buildings, permanently adding them to an evolving map, and unlock crates that provide new rules and gameplay elements. At the end of each game, you'll be rewarded or punished based on how well you completed the scenario's goal, and everyone will get to improve their charters, allowing them to carry over items between games or get start-of-game bonuses for the next game. At the end of 12 games, one player is awarded the win for the entire campaign. The game doesn't end there, though, as now your group has their own unique copy of Charterstone that they can continue to play. While not completely unique, it is one of the few legacy games where you're not done with the board once the game is complete. Correct. So for a spoiler-free look at the components you get in this campaign game, check out the Charterstone unboxing video on YouTube. Now, as far as component quality goes, Charterstone's near perfect. Uh, my only complaint at all is that many of the cards in the game have stickers on them that you have to peel off, and that's a little difficult to do without bending the cards. Now, normally this is an issue with stickers. You just bend them all as much as you want as long as you get the sticker off. But in this game, most of the sticker cards then need to be shuffled back into a deck once the sticker is removed. While I found this annoying, we never actually found it ruin the game or mark the cards in a way that gave anyone any real advantage while playing. Your mileage may vary here. Perhaps a small knife to get the stickers started could yeah. help them remain flat or just riffle shuffle till they're all bent the same way. <laughs> now, didn't you also have a glue problem on the lid of one of the boxes? You know what? That came up in our unboxing video and I completely forgot about it because when I did the unboxing, I fixed it. So yes, the index, which is like the, the big box of all the stuff you're going to unlock, has a magnetic flap that closes. Mine was completely disconnected. When I tried to take it out of the box, it did pop apart. Now, some white glue and some elastics did fix that, but that just goes to show how long ago it was that we started this campaign that I actually completely forgot that problem. Again, no impact on gameplay, just a little physical component issue. 
Now, besides the sticker issue, the components in Charterstone are awesome. Uh, the various meeples are great looking, uh, easy to tell apart. The card quality is excellent. The various boxes to organize everything actually works great. It's almost like the game comes with a box insert in a way, even though it's just a bunch of talk boxes. Uh, the metal coins are fantastic. Uh, the wooden resources each have a unique shape and color, which is good for accessibility. Uh, the rule book's pretty clear. Um, there is an FAQ out there, and you are going to want to look at it. But thankfully, in the later printings of the game, this is included. My game had the most recent FAQ. Um, you can easily go online to compare to make sure you have the most recent. Um, I also appreciate they included a two-sided board with the game. Uh, this is so you can actually play through the campaign twice. No note to use the other side of the board. You do have to pick up the Charterstone Recharge Pack, which is sold separately. Now, with that overview done, I think it's time to move on to talking about how you play this competitive campaign game. So while the rules in Charterstone do evolve as you play through the basic campaign, the basic game structure will stay the same for every single one of your 12 games. So each game starts with everyone gathering the stuff for their charter. Now, you get a box for every charter and you store your stuff in there. You then go through setup, which involves placing things on the board, randomly building buildings for charters that aren't being played. They're called inactive charters. Now you do this to keep the board balanced and make sure to provide plenty of worker placement spots while also allowing a player to join in partway through the campaign. So even the charters that aren't being played will evolve and get more buildings added to them. This joining in partway through is a really nice feature. And I have to say from my experience, it actually works pretty smoothly. Now, while you may not know what's happening in the mm -hmm. wider sense, you don't feel like you're a mile behind everybody. Uh, next, players are going to pick one of their Persona cards to use for this game. Now, for your first game, you only have one Persona card, but you'll be unlocking more regularly as the campaign goes on. Now, each Persona card provides a unique asymmetric ability. Now, also, at the end of the campaign, you're going to get points for each Persona you actually used, so it encourages you to swap out Personas every game. And we all know this show's opinion <laughs> on asymmetric player abilities. Uh, next, players gain starting bonuses. These are going to be unlocked through previous games. So on your little charter box, you've got stuff you can mark off, and you're going to earn points based on how well you score at the end of each game, which each 10 points gives you the ability to fill in one star on your box. Now, when you fill in a complete row of stars, you unlock a bonus. There's all kinds of these on the box, and they include things like starting with different resources, starting with money, getting to take cards from the market before the game starts, the ability to use more than one persona, and more. Needless to say, while they're just colored in stars on a tuck box, they play a pretty important role in the yes. game. Next, the Charter Stone die is rolled. This is a unique die with a symbol for each of the charters on it to determine who starts the game. In every game, every player gets an equal amount of turns, so you can keep the Charter Stone to mark that. Now, once you start playing, on your turn, you have two choices. Either place out a worker or collect all of your workers already placed on the board. Now, workers are placed on buildings, each of which is going to list a cost and a benefit. You pay the cost, get the benefit. Now, some buildings, for example, the basic production buildings have no cost. You just place it and get the benefit. If you place your worker on a spot where there's another player's worker, you bump them, they get the worker back, and you get to take the action. Which is important, since otherwise they'd need a full turn to recover their workers. Now, at the very start of your Charterstone campaign, each charter is going to have one basic resource building. There's a spot that generates one of the six resources with each charter producing a different resource. In addition to this, there's six buildings already printed on the board. During setup for your first game, players will also get a number of cards, which they'll need to use these buildings. As the campaign continues, players will be adding a lot more buildings to the map. So stickers, stickers, and more stickers. Now, before I get into what the buildings do, I need to mention influence. Every player starts with 12 influence tokens. These are spent to take various actions in the game and are part of the game's timing mechanism as well. If a player ever runs out of influence tokens, not only are their, limit, their options now limited, but the progress track advances every time it's their turn, which can quickly bring the game to its end. Which could be your goal or something you're trying to avoid. Another tricky aspect of this game you need to work out for yourself. Now, the basic buildings already in the map include the Zeppelin. That lets you build a new building. You pay three of those influence tokens and four resources shown on the building card you have, and then you put the sticker on the board. Um, you remove the sticker, place it somewhere in your charter. 
Now this is gonna score you points and also advance the progress track. Now after building, if the card you built has a crate symbol on it, and most do, especially at the beginning of the game, you then keep the card. And the reason is for the next building, the Charter Stone. When you use the Charter Stone, you pay four coins, you turn in some more influence, and then you turn in a building card that's already been built that has a crate on it. You look up that crate number on the chart and start removing cards from the index. Again, the index is a big box of stuff you can unlock. Now, during doing this, you may introduce new game rules. You may get more cards to add to your hand. You may get more cards to add to the supply. Uh, it may award the player opening the crate new buildings and personas and more. There's lots of things to unlock in this game. You might even need to open up another box that comes with the game and unlock new components instead of just new cards. Unlocking crates is the main way the game evolves during play. Unlocking crates also scores you points and events as the progress track. Not surprisingly, one of, if not the, main game advancing me me mechanic is triggered by using the building the game is named after. Yes, that is the Charter Stone. Now, the treasury spot on the board lets you exchange goods for gold, and the market lets you trade gold and a resource to take a card from the advancement mat. Now, this advancement mat is a separate board that holds an advancement deck and five face-up cards you can choose from. Now, at the very beginning of the game, you may not even have five to put into play. These start off just being buildings you can build. But that deck, the advancement deck, quickly grows as the game goes on and eventually features multiple different card types. And if the game was only the crates, you'd find the lack of variety wear on you by the end of each game. Yeah. But this is a nice way to keep even more fresh content available. Now, another sideboard holds a deck and a set of three face-up objective cards. Players can claim these by going to the bandstand, which again scores the points and advances the progress track. Uh, this action costs an influence token. Now, the objective deck, again, starts off small and grows during the game and includes things like having one of each resource type, collecting six gold in total and more. Pretty standard objective system for this sort of game. Nothing that's going to wow you, but an important part of this style of game. Now, the final way to score victory points, at least when the game starts off, is to go to the cloud port. Here, you can trade in various things for points based on what's called the quota track, a little grid in the top of the board. What you can turn in includes cards, resources, and coins, as well as more things later on as you unlock them. Now, the quota track includes some spots where you can gain bonus points or reputation for filling in those orders. Now, reputation is another track on the board where every time you gain reputation, you take one of your influence tokens and put it on this track. At the end of the game, this is an area majority thing. The players will score points for having the most, second most, and third most reputation on this track. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of tracks and things to worry about. Because it's a legacy game, it starts off slow and really lets you grasp everything firmly. Now, as mentioned already, various actions will advance the progress marker. We keep talking about this. This is another track that forms the timer for the game. The length of the track is based on the player count, and the game ends with every player getting an equal number of turns once the progress marker hits the end of the track. Now, along this track, there are also some icons that indicate the player who caused the marker to move gets some kind of reward. Now, at the start of the campaign, this only includes reputation, but there will be something else unlocked later. Get there faster, get a reward, but end the game sooner. Now, in addition to these basic worker placement spots, of course, players are going to be adding a ton more spots to the board that do all kinds of things, like you know, the ability to trade in resources for different rewards, the ability to buy specific cards from the market, improved ways to build buildings and unlock crates that are worth more points, and other uses for influence tokens as well as plenty more. Now, as well as giving everyone more things to do, each building you build gives the player controlling it points at the end of the campaign, which can lead to some pretty interesting decisions about what buildings to build, if you should be building the building for the ability on it, or if you want to build it for the points. I mean, it is a legacy game after all. Now, at the end of each game, everyone calculates their final score for that game. This includes points for the rank on the reputation track I mentioned earlier, and any end game scoring cards the players may have collected. Next, you check to see who best fulfilled the goal of the scenario as indicated on a guide postcard. And the note in the first game, you won't have a guide postcard, but you're going to see those so early that I don't even feel like it's a spoiler mentioning them. You're then going to scratch off this card and do what it says. Um, my wife commented in the chat room here that one of the things she doesn't like about the game is trying to scratch off that card because the metal coins included don't do a very good job. 
We also don't suggest using any of the resources. You might want to get an actual coin when trying to do it. So what you do is you scratch it off, like a scratch ticket, and then do what the card says. Now, in most scenarios, I'd say many of the scenarios, the player who earned the card is going to get a choice. Now, that choice could affect the scoring of this game, unlock new things, add new rules, etc. Now, after completing whatever it says on the guide postcard, the player with the most points wins. They get to mark off a trophy on their character box, which is worth points at the end of the campaign, and everyone else gets to fill in a capacity circle on their box. Now, every circle filled in on that box lets you carry over one thing from this game to the next, and don't um, put aside how important that can be. Now, for those who've been listening along with the plays will know, winning a game is not the be-all and end-all. This is an ongoing process, so pace yourself. Finally, players are awarded glory. Everyone gets one glory for every 10 points they scored this game, with a bonus point given to the player who best completed the scenario goal, whoever claimed the guide postcard. Each point lets you fill in one star on your character box, as I already talked about before, with the setup where you get bonus stuff for the next game. Also know every point of glory gives you points at the end of the campaign, and it's a significant amount. It's 10 poor star you fill in. After you finish your game, you pack everything up or play again, but make sure you only carry over the proper things based on what you've unlocked on your charter box because you don't want to take too much stuff or not take what you can carry over. Cleaning up, scoring, and making sure the right things go in your box and nothing else is probably the hardest part of that game, yeah. and yet it's still not really that hard. Just also be sure, just as, uh, again, Deanna's in the chat room, be sure you're using your box while playing the game and not putting stuff in someone else's box which seemed to be an ongoing problem in our particular Charter Stone games. So at the end of your 12 campaign game, there's a final scoring system, which I can't talk about much because it's not fully explained until partway through the campaign. You don't even know everything you're going to be scoring. What you do know from the start is that you're going to be scoring points on your buildings, the personas you used, the glory you've earned, and points for the games you've won. Okay, that covers the basics of how Charter Stone plays. What did you and your group think of this legacy game? So I wasn't sure what to expect when we first sat down to start our Charterstone campaign. The reviews I've read, watched, and listened to since it came out were very mixed. Many of the early reviews called the game too simple, and I saw the term basic worker placement game thrown around quite a bit. Now, one thing I noticed, though, is that many of these reviews weren't from people who played the entire campaign. It seemed quite a few people played the first game or first couple of games, shared their thoughts, and then moved on. Or if they didn't move on and continued to play, they never went back and updated everyone to say what they thought once they finished the campaign. It does seem that there was a trend of people who started it, lost interest, and moved on, or perhaps lost a couple of games and felt it wasn't possible to win at that point and gave up. Yeah, that is highly possible, which please don't do that. There, there, there's <laughs> Losing a few games isn't going to mean that much in this. Now, when I agreed to review this game, I knew the first thing I knew when I said yes was I don't want to do this. I wanted to be in for the long haul since day one. While I've been sharing some thoughts on the Bellhop's Tabletop segment of our podcast and sharing it on the What You've Been Playing Wednesday, some of our thoughts as we play through the campaign, I wanted to save this, my final review, for once we were actually done our campaign, playing all 12 games. Now, we even took it a step further than that. Since, once you're done Charterstone campaign, you can continue to play your or unique copy of the game. I wanted to try that as well before reviewing the game. So here I am now. Campaign's done, and we even tried an after-campaign game. So overall, how'd it go? Great. Well, that's it, folks. Thanks for coming out to our review of Charterstone from Stonemeyer Games. Oops, sorry, a few more thoughts. <laughs> I worry something, that's long enough. Someone might just like turn off YouTube. We, we might want to cut that out. All right, so while I do agree, Charterstone starts off as a pretty basic, straightforward worker placement game, but it evolves into something so much more. It's pretty early into the game, you start unlocking more things, giving all of the players more options. Now for us, game three was the big game. The game where we unlocked so much stuff, it almost felt like we were playing a new game, 
and setup for game four was actually confusing because there were so many new game elements. And for a bit there, everyone was literally lost because they were just like, whoa, there's this and that and that and this. And what are we doing? And what's the goal? And now we have to worry about this. It can actually be overwhelming when you hit that big, it's almost like a cliff where you're like, okay, yeah, I get it. And you say, whoa, what is all this stuff? See, this was really interesting for me, not because I was playing, but because I was watching at a distance. Uh, and I had gone through knowing I wasn't going to be able to play more than the one game I did play and read a lot of reviews and player thoughts on the game. Mm. And the reviews I read had indicated things like this at this time were going to happen. And it was really interesting hearing your playthrough sort of matching those expectations mm. and, and these the, these weirdness and, and, and shock coming through yes. at the right time. <laughs> It seems like it's game three or four for most people. So I would honestly say, like, if you're going to try, don't give up till you hit that. If you haven't hit a part where you're just like, whoa, whoa, what's happening? You might want to keep trying. Now, added to the fun, brought on by added complexity, as Charter Stone evolves, you also get a pretty solid story that features Branson's past. Now, this isn't a big novella. You're not having a big epic story. But after each game, you 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 have a goal and how well you do on that goal determines the reward, as well as affecting the story and potential future games. And I'm trying to be vague here, and it's a little hard. Um, these rewards can be positive or negative, and I've got to say some were a huge shock to our group. Once again, winning or losing each individual game is of less importance than many gamers will assume. Now, through the guide postcards, each individual single game of Charter Stone is unique during the campaign. There's always some form of restriction or bonus in place each game that's what kept things interesting. Like we personally found some of these very annoying, while others were awesome and we wish they were in play every time. Uh, what I will say here is that each game is totally unique and you never get the same sped of special rules for scenario twice. And for people who have seen the game or watched the unboxing, yes, there is a reason your two people are different sizes. Which is why the legacy portion of the game is replayable with the refresh pack. Now, while the basic worker placement mechanic of place a worker to cl or collect all your workers stays the same, and you're always going to be dealing with the same six resources and gold, what you're going to focus on and with each of these mechanics will change each game. So a solid foundation the game builds up from, you have to say. Now, one of the things that took us a bit to get used to is the fact Charterstone is a competitive legacy game. Because the group I played with, Corey and Kat and Deanna and I, is the same group that played through Pandemic Legacy and the same group that played through a big chunk of Gloomhaven. And I've got to say, it felt a bit odd playing a competitive legacy game after those two games. Like the first game, we, we just kind of felt like we wanted to trade resources with each other and all build the city together. In the end, though, we all got into it and found we really enjoyed the competitive elements of the game. Unlike some other worker placement games, Charterstone can get quite cutthroat at times. And while there aren't many ways to directly screw over your opponents, it's more about getting certain things before them or making sure you also get rewarded when your opponents do something. Timing? and hate drafting more than direct effects. It's not multiplayer solitaire, but you're not smiting your neighbors either. Although there are some personas later in the game that get a little smitey. <laughs> now, everyone in our group really enjoyed our Charterstone campaign, with games being engaging enough that some nights we finished two in a row. There was one night we talked about a third game, but we didn't do it. I just wanted to stretch it out a little further. I was worried the game was going to start to feel repetitive because, like I said, the basic mechanics and the resources don't change. The tracks are all there. Uh, well, there was a bit of that, like by the end, especially, it did start to like you kind of doing the same things. That whole guidepost system really helped to mix things up each game. Now, where this fell apart was playing after we finished the campaign. Well, yes, you can continue to play your copy of Charterstone after you're finished. The campaign we all found it just wasn't a very rewarding experience like we did find that the game worked surprisingly well um everyone takes on the role of a random chart and there's a new drafting system to determine what you start each game with for example the personas you're going to take all the personas you've unlocked shuffle them and draft some there's other stuff you're also going to draft mechanically it was sound 
and I've got to say felt very well balanced. The, the game we played, our scores were close the whole time. Like it was a race going around the track, everyone leapfrogging each other. It was, a, and it was a really neat, honestly, the best part about doing it was getting to play someone else's charter. Um, I basically, I played Tori's charter. I had the yellow charter. Someone else played these charters. Someone played one of the charters that, um, that wasn't played by a player. That part was neat. The problem though, with playing a completed game of charter stone is that it just didn't feel like it mattered. There were no stakes. It's a, it's a, it's one standalone game. And if you win, you win. Yay. You, you won your game of charter stone. You don't get anything new. You don't get to carry anything over. You don't get to improve your charter. You don't get to do anything that'll pay off later. Well, yes, you can still build buildings and unlock crates, assuming you haven't gone through everything in the deck. And we most definitely did not. There was still plenty of stuff to build. And yeah, the board may change, but the changes you make affect a charter you may never, ever play again. And it just, I don't know. It just didn't give that I've improved myself and I get to be better later because of what I did. It's completely gone. Yeah, and I must say that this is supported by pretty much every other review of this game who'd made it that far that I read. It's interesting that you can play it, but why would you is sort of the general consensus that I pretty much saw everyone who finished the yeah. game mentioning. It, yeah, you can. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, having tried play to finish game of Charter Stone, I don't think I'll ever do it again. Um, the only thing I can see being useful for as someone who who runs local gaming events or, you know, if you didn't get to play the one game while you were down is this might be a way to introduce the game to someone who's curious. Like, oh, what's Charter Stone all about? As long as they're not too worried about, you know, seeing buildings and having things in play that aren't there at the beginning. Um, I could see like just using it to show off Charter Stone. Like, hey, come check this game out because there's no reason. I couldn't now go play my copy with a group of five other strangers and we might have a pretty solid board game experience. But personally, what I'm much more interested in and very tempted to do is to pick up the recharge pack and play through a totally new campaign. Because the thought of playing through the campaign, knowing what we know now, would be a completely different experience than that first playthrough. So the spoilers will impact how you play, but not necessarily lessen your enjoyment of the game. No. Though I do expect that if only some people at the table knew the spoilers, it might be more problematic. I, I don't know about problematic. Like, I think that player will still get the joy of, hey, this new thing's been unlocked. But it, they're, I, you're going to have a tactical advantage for certain scenarios knowing what's going to happen. Right. Um, especially with the goals when you get those multiple choices. Um, like, even in game two, like, I, I, we all would have played game two very differently um game nine i think was another big one like there were certain games that, that did things at the end that knowing ahead of time could totally change the outcome right now the biggest concern i think every group is going to have with charter stone is being able to find a group of players willing to play through 12 rounds of the same game um board game industry the board game players the common how people play games nowadays is not to repeat play the same game over and over um, it's usually a small handful of games, if that, if not just one and done. Now, while the game does include rules for adding and removing players, and they work, they work fairly well, but they just feel forced. Um, more interesting to me are the automata, or automa, sorry, I always want to say automata. They don't, Jamie doesn't call it automata, it's automa. It's an Italian word uh, that lets a bot play in any charters not played by characters. No, you cannot start with a bot. You can add them after game one. I think if you're thinking that you may have someone join in your campaign, like at game one, if you're like, we're starting with four people, but Dave may join us later when, you know, he's off shift work or whatever. I think start using that bot right away. Like I, I strongly recommend use bots for any inactive charter so that when someone does join, they end up in pretty good shape. And I also recommend if someone leaves, keep using a bot for that charter in case someone rejoins or just to keep them competitive until the end of the game. Now, again, all of this works, but to me, it's just not the ideal way to play. If possible, you want to start and finish your campaign with the same players through. It's going to lead to a more balanced ending, and it's going to make sure that everyone gets to take part in all aspects of the story and get to evolve with the game instead of being thrown in like Sean was to the deep end with all this stuff already unlocked. Not surprising, given that almost every legacy game is similar. 
the fact that they do have these methods of introducing players as they do uh and the ultima to sort of keep them playing along is the odd part out yeah and again you don't have to use the ultima because there is a system as part of setup where you're going to build buildings for them even without the atom so it's not completely abandoned so overall our group, my game group, really enjoyed Charterstone. Uh, this is a competitive worker placement game that slowly evolves and improves as you play through it. There's an engaging story that features a lot of later payoff for early decisions. There's also a campaign that, where playing the long game can pay off, and winning a specific individual game can be way less important than the improvements you make during that game to your charter. Remember that. Don't rage quit if you lost the first three or four games. You still have a lot of game left and potential to win. Yes. If you can find a group of gamers who dig worker placement games and are willing to commit to playing the same game 12 times, you should be picking up Charterstone. I realize the MSRP is up there, but split the cost with your group. You're going to get a lot of game out of those 12 plays. And I don't see any reason not to pick up Charterstone. If you're, you like worker placements, this is a fantastic worker placement experience. Just don't expect to get more than 12 plays. If your group yeah. likes it afterwards, great. But don't expect it to wow you going in. But then maybe budget for picking up that fairly cheap recharge pack because you may get a full 24 games out of your copy of Charterstone. Now, if you got a core group of six gamers, but with some players who can't make it all the time, or a group where you get a different group of six every session, I think you could have a great time playing through a Charterstone campaign. My only suggestion is to make sure everyone's there for the first game and then use the Atoma for any players not present on game night. A fantastic option that not a lot of games give you. Now, if you and your group don't like worker placement games, while there's a small chance Charterstone may win you over, it's probably not worth the risk, especially at the cost. Now, I do want to point out, though, the one mechanic that many people don't like about worker placement games is the fact you can't go on a spot that's taken. That's not an effect here. This is a worker placement game where you can bump the opponents. So you basically can place your workers anywhere you want. So other players' workers don't actually limit what you can do on your turn. They're not limiting you, but you are giving a bonus to the person yes. whose people you replace. Now, as for groups looking for an epic fantasy campaign that tells you an epic quest and an ongoing, evolving story, you're probably better off sticking to other campaign games. While Charterstone has some fantasy elements, it is very much a Euro worker placement game at its core. You're not going to be battling any monsters or delving any dungeons here. It felt very, I, I want to say, fluffy for fantasy in elements in, in the one game I played. Certainly no sword swinging. And no rolling to hit, tracking hit points, or any of that. Now, before I go, I want to share a few more of our group's thoughts on Charterstone and specific aspects of the game we enjoyed based on things we unlocked. Now, I can't do that here without spoiling some things in the game. So I've broken those out after this. Now, note, I will not be spoiling any of the story or the surprise twists. I'm just going to be talking about the cool mechanics and systems that are added to the game. So this may be where you want to check out and try it for yourself. Now, fair warning, knowing any of this is not going to ruin the game in any way. These aren't the kind of spoilers where you're going to change your decisions because you know they're coming. All right, so first off, talking about Charter Stone without spoiling it is hard. Um, it's especially hard now, 12 plus games in, when it's hard to remember what was an added rule and what was part of the game from the start, made even more difficult because you overlay stickers in the rule book so I couldn't even look up what the heck the stupid card is, the name of it. I had to Google the rule book and find an unedited version of the rules to find it. Um, but I think in the above, I may not spoil anything. I at least didn't spoil anything that's not unlocked by game two. Now that's about the change. So again, if you don't want to know how Charterstone changes your play, jump ahead to the next segment now. You're going to want to jump ahead. So one of the things we unlocked very early in our game of Charterstone are minions. Minions are awesome. These are additional workers you can purchase that let you take more actions on your turn, but minions can only be placed in your own charter. In addition to this, every minion gives you a bonus, both when you place it and when someone else uses a spot you have a minion on. So that was the whole thing I mentioned about trying to plan out your strategy so that when your opponent gets something, you also get rewarded. It's all about putting your minions on your valuable spots and like begging, come on, go ahead and use it. Now, each minion has its own uniquely shaped meeple, 
And I got to say, unlocking the cat minions first um, did probably affect our joy of unlocking minions even more awesome. Now, of all the things you unlock in Charterstone, I think the minions had the biggest impact on play. So, and well, they're cats. Some of them. There are multiple different minions, each unlocking different abilities. Now, another early unlock for us was Peril. These are tiny colored cubes, which I'm not sure why they're so small, that are scattered all over the board at the start of the game. I say scattered, there's one place in every building. Uh, these represent bad things happening in your village and include things like famine, bandits, and fuel shortages. Now, sadly, this theming got lost. Um, our group just referred to them as cubes in various colors. Not once in our game did someone say, I'm going to go work on this disrepair. They just said, hey, give me that blue cube. Yeah, I'm sure you told me what they were when I played, uh, but it very clearly wasn't important. No, no, it's it's the Lords of Water Deep effect. I use three orange guys and a black guy to trade this in. Now, what I did like about Peril is that as the game unlocked or went on, we unlocked more and more things we could do with them in the form of additional buildings and gold cards. Like the first couple of games they came out, it was just kind of annoying. Like mainly there's a rule where you can't place a minion unless it's an empty spot. So it meant that I couldn't place my minions in turn one. Um, but later, by the end of the campaign, they end up turning into a big source of income and points by the end. So peril is a currency. Which I got to say is a little weird. And then turning in the peril at the ice cream shop to get points felt a little more abstract than it should have <laughs> been. But again, if you're just thinking about cubes, it's fine. Now, the big next big unlock that really changed things up were the Sky Islands. Uh, this is one of the things that in that game three got dropped on us with other things. Uh, what a unique system. Uh, it's a way to give everyone more way to build and more room to build, plus more options during setup. Now, the rule that you have to use to every game, I got to say, can be frustrating, especially when you first unlock them and there's nothing on them because they just built all these things. I don't want to cover them up. And then there's the choice of do I cover up an empty spot on my board with an empty sky island? But then I also want something on that board eventually, so I have to cover up something good. Like there's some really interesting decision points added with sky islands and i've got to say at the very end of the campaign our last three games or so it was interesting to see everyone to try to scramble to try to build at least something on every island so they could get that end game scoring always fun when you've got a mechanic that makes your players scramble <laughs> now there was one aspect of the game we i almost want to say we didn't touch but it was there is crafting items now as the person who controlled the index pulling cards out it's kind of hard not to spoil it when you're you're flipping through looking for small numbers i kept seeing these cards and i'm like oh these look awesome but we didn't unlock the ability to craft items until game 11 i think it was and in that game one crafting card came up the entire game i think someone bought it and did it now during game 12 we saw two so crafting made pretty much no impact on our campaign I found disappointing because it's a really cool system where you get the card and then trade in a set of resources to build the thing, and then you get a reward for it, mostly points, but also other stuff. And I'm like, ah, oh, because I got to say, playing through the first 11 games, our resources were just kind of these things we traded in for money, like then, and we used them to build specific buildings. But pretty early in the game, we made we had a way that we didn't have to pay resources to build buildings. So resources were just kind of like there. And there were some neat combos to get money. Whereas if you had crafting, it's like, oh, now I really care about getting, say, steel and wood to be able to build this hammer. Yeah, and this is part of the random legacy factor and why every playthrough is going to be different. Yeah, like if someone had unlocked these game one, the whole campaign would have played different. It would have been all about amassing big piles of resources to build items. And that was not our goals. We were much more about using your resources to get money and trading money in for points was kind of how many of our campaign games went. Now, as for the twist at the end, um, I predicted it pretty much from game, well, game two, um, when you get the first, you're happy, happy or sad. And I, though I got to say, I did not expect it to play out the way it did. I will say it was very rewarding. What wasn't overly rewarding, that was the end of game 11, right? Was the end of game 12. After adding up everyone's points and seeing who won, there was just, very little story. I wanted to read three, four cards. I wanted a finale. I wanted a denouement. Not just they throw a parade in your armor, in your honor, and here you go. Here's how you play now if you want to keep playing. I would have liked more fanfare at the very end. It, it just felt slightly anticlimactic. Maths and rules. Not the most satisfying wrap-up. 
Now, as already mentioned, Charter's Tone was pretty much perfect for our group. We had a great time playing. I'm glad we took the time to play through the entire thing before reviewing it, though, as you didn't really get the full experience without playing through a full campaign. Like, I totally didn't even know there was crafting items, except I kept seeing cards that look like that's probably obviously what they're for, but, like, we never even got to experience that. Um, we only unlocked all the minions because we got to a part in the game that says if you haven't unlocked them all, unlock the rest. Like, we didn't actually unlock them all. Um, I, I just think this game overall is going to be great for a lot of different groups of people. And uh, the investment's high. So you got to make sure you have that buy-in. Um, but like, and it's not really a good try before you buy a game. But I think a lot of game groups are going to enjoy this one, um, especially if you've already enjoyed legacy games. I think playing a competitive one is a nice twist. Like if you played through all the pandemic legacies, throwing this on the table is going to be a nice, I don't know, paradigm shift for your group. And I think you're going to enjoy that aspect of it. It took a bit to sell us, but once we got there, we played pretty cutthroat going forward. Well, that's really it for our review <laughs> of Charterstone. Now, when you have time, I also welcome you to check out the written version of this review over at tabletopbellhop.com. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. All right, so my week in gaming this week started off with a game of Charterstone, and after the campaign game that I wanted to make sure we tried before the review tonight. And it was interesting. Now, as noted in the review, the biggest problem with this is it just felt like it didn't matter. There was no incentive to win. Now, the really striking part about that, and what's really odd to me, is how is that different from every other game that I have in my collection? Because that, that it, and it doesn't bother me. Like, when I play Terraforming Mars, I love Terraforming Mars, but you just play to win. And when you win, you're done, it's it. You don't progress, you don't save anything. It's the exact same thing. But for some reason with Charterstone, it just bothered me. Well, not just me, because everyone just felt like, eh, there's no stakes, this doesn't matter. Like, I guess it's just the change in feel from moving from campaign to regular play. But what it, whatever it was, like, like why it, it hurts in Charterstone and not in the thousand other games I own, I, none of us are interested in playing it again, uh, at least unless we start a whole new campaign. Yeah, and as mentioned during the review, this seems pretty universal among players of it. I think, you know, when you've invested what between 12 and 24 hours in a game, yeah. in a certain... Uh, with a certain method, a certain uh, style, you develop certain expectations. And, uh, you know, how can you not notice the step back from that? Yeah, the absence of it, yeah. right? And, like, there were fun parts. Like I said, getting to play a new target was cool. Um, but, and what they do is you have you draft. Oh, I don't want to spoil anything here either. You're going to draft stuff, right? So being able to draft some of the things was kind of cool because I got to see personas. I mean, everyone knows you're going to get multiple personas. I got to see personas I'd never seen before. And um, interesting, you also randomly distribute those things that give you more room to build, <laughs> which was also pretty cool. Like getting to, to shift those around was kind of neat. But just like, and, and Deanna pointed this out in the chat while we we're in the review, and I didn't want to call it out then. It also made the game long because there weren't tons of buildings to build or crates to unlock. So there wasn't anything making the progress track go. Plus, you didn't carry anything over. So we didn't have four or five cards in front of us, four or five resources and three bucks in front of us at the start of the game. So it was a very slow build and the game ended up long. Like I think it took us two hours to play as opposed to an hour at the normal game because you start with kind of a head start. And yes, there were some rules where you got to take some money or take some resources, but it wasn't nearly as much as you would carry over game to game. Yeah, well, I mean, you have to think of it this way. You know, think, think a perfect example, I think, is imagine if you'd played um terraforming mars 12 times always using prelude yeah and then all of a sudden here's terraforming mars but there's no more play prelude you don't get prelude anywhere again anymore yeah. it's just just the rest of the game just the rest of the game you're missing oh you're just missing yeah. that that's something i want to start my engine please <laughs> exactly or I, we even get this with space space the other day i played space space without the light speed variant and i was just like oh my god I forgot how long it can take to start that starter engine at the beginning. How many turns can go by when I get nothing? Yep. All right, moving away from that one. We're done with Charter Stone. May never talk about it again. I think your group will dig it. I, I, most people I know, most people I have played games with would enjoy it. 
Uh, if I still had my Monday night group, I'd be tempted to pick up another copy just to go through it with a different group and see how things change. But then I'd have an unfair advantage, so I don't know how that would work. All right, next up, four-player game of Quacks with Herd Witches. Uh, this was my first time playing with the expansion with Tori and Cat. Uh, not a lot I need to say here. They both agreed it's a great expansion. Um, at this point, I've gone on. It's must-have. Uh, like, I don't see any reason why someone wouldn't want to use this expansion every game of Quacks you play. Um, obviously I've already added all the components to my core box and I don't see ever pulling it out, but I also don't see any reason if you own quacks, not to pick up herb, Witches, except for the fact you can't get the game anymore. Herb, Witches seems to be readily available. So we have now completely sold Tori and cat on this. They have decided the next time they go to the cottage, they're bringing quacks, except they can't find it. Uh, yet again, this game is out of print. Um, the only options out there right now seem to be the overpriced big box editions um, that are just on the secondary market, which I can't even find MSRPs of. So like they, at some point, released a big box that has Herb Witches. Now there's another big box, and I don't know if they're called big box, they're called something else, that includes Herb Witches and Alchemists. Now I'm thinking you probably want the big box that includes all of them, but like the price online right now are like 180 bucks, and I, I don't think that's accurate. I think that's people uh, taking advantage of the fact they're out of print right now. Uh, unfortunately, this is not published by an American publisher or North American publisher for that matter. So it may be, that's the only way to get the games. But um, I, I think the publisher did not predict just how big a hit this game was going to be. And don't forget that this is a pre-pandemic game. Uh, yeah. Though I'm sure the current worldwide problems are impacting their supply chain. Yeah, uh, like it, it, it has, it's at least on a second printing, if not third. So this might be a fourth they're working on. So if anyone knows where you can pick it up in Canada, let us know and I'll pass that info on to Tori and Kat. So I think I pretty much did our due diligence already on trying to find copies. Next up, another one off the pile of shame. As mentioned before, we're trying, I am, I am, have been making a dedicated effort to get that pile of shame down. Um, this time it was Revolution of 1828. This is a two-player only Stefan Feld game from Renegade Games. Now, this one is very much an abstract tug of war style game with a pasted on theme that does nothing for me as a Canadian. Now, thankfully, the theme doesn't really matter because the gameplay is very solid. You're not a fan of Andrew Jackson and the two party system? I'm just not a fan of a rule book that's 14 pages of history and background in, in a country I don't live in. <laughs> um, and it's including multiple chapters on why they call it revolution and not election of 1828. But anyway, I, enough about the history. I'm sure to Americans, this is a, a bigger deal than it is to me. Um, in Revolution of 1828, you got a central player board, and it's divided up into different electoral regions, five of them, and then a spot for the press. You're going to start each round by taking out these chits, they kind of look like um, poker chips, out of a bag and placing three in each of those different sections. On your turn, the only thing you do is you take a chit from a spot. Now, if you take the last chit, you get to move the meeple there, that's the elector. You get to move them to your side of the board and take a bonus turn. Now, the chits you take are either delegates, campaign actions, or smear campaigns. Delegates are placed on your side of the board under the appropriate region. It's all color-coded. And there's icons for those who may have um, colorblindness issues. Campaign actions break the rules in some way. They're going to let you move chits, take extra chits, take extra turns, etc. Now, smear campaigns are hugely powerful because they're wildcard delegates. When you take one, you can place it in any region. Now, after all the tiles are gone from the board, you're going to score each region. The player with the most delegates in a region gets votes, and then you score bonus points for whoever holds the elector. They're going to get one point per delegate in their area, whether they won the vote or not. So that's kind of interesting. So you may have, have less chips, but because you have that electorate, you might actually get more votes than your opponent does. Now, the press is the really interesting twist to this game. You do not want the press paying attention to you during the election. If they are... They are watching you, and you are going to have to give one vote to your opponent first every smear campaign you have. And note, everything wipes be turning rounds except smear campaigns. So it's certainly an interesting idea, even if the theme isn't universal. I, the theme doesn't hurt it in any way, I will say. I wouldn't have rushed out to pick up this game because of the theme. I will point that out. If it would have been an abstract battle game, I might have been more interested into it, though I don't know how you'd you'd have to throw in something different than the press and smear campaigns. But some of the curses, if you used evil dark magic on your turn, the wizard pays attention to you. Would have worked fine. I could totally make this a Lord of the Rings game. 
So while we did mess things up pretty bad on the first couple of plays, Bellhop's law was totally in effect. Uh, the first play was very much extreme. Um, we totally forgot that when you take an elector, you take an extra turn. That's huge. Like that is massively huge in this game because otherwise you're just trying to time it out. So you go, I go, you go, I go. And, and no, with those extra turns, it totally changed everything. And then the second time we messed up what one of the tokens do. So one complaint about the game is it's all abstract. It's all art. And you got to reference the rule book. So I got to say by play three, we had pretty much memorized what everything was but there's nothing on the tokens to tell you what they do. Like abstract to the fact it's not even icons. It's like a picture of a newspaper or it's a picture of some dude at a ballot box. Um, but even messing it up, we could tell it like, oh, this looks interesting. Like, like there's, there's some, the, the back and forth of, well, if I take this, then you take that, that means I get the electric. So there's no way you're taking that. But if I take this and move this chip here, like, like that's the kind of thought process you're going through. So this is one of those times where we play three games in a row. Uh, the third game, which I think we actually played by the proper rules. Um, in the game, and we were sold. Like, uh, this this was Deanna's, like, I like this. Um, this is a really solid two-player only game. Uh, I think this gets added to the date night and trip out of town regular pile, um, at least for, for the next little while until we get sick of it. So compared to the much-loved, except by you, Watergate, <laughs> this one comes out strongly ahead? Oh, yeah, by, like 100%. Um, both with equally uninteresting themes to me, but no, this was this was better than Watergate. Uh, this play is more like, uh, for anyone who knows it, Battle Line or Shot and Totten, or um, there were some other Cosmos games that used the same system where you're building stuff up in columns and trying to outdo your opponent. There was definitely more of that. There's even some Lost Cities feel here, but with the random bag. Um, so yeah, no, definitely. This one's a win. Watergate was not. I hope our friend Brian is enjoying his copy of Watergate because that's where mine went. Now, my last game for this week was more plays of the game from Pandasaurus. Uh, this time, we finally got down to one card. One. This was our closest yet. Um, I got to say, this has got to be part of what keeps making us play it because because we haven't done the perfect win where we played all cards. No 10 or less cards is a win, but like a perfect win or whatever, an excellent game. We're so close to actually playing every card. It's going to happen. Um, note that uh, our other play was absolutely horrible. Like Like there was a deck left. Like it was bad. Um, I'm wondering what's going to happen. Like, if we ever do do it, are we going to move on? We're like, all right, we did it. We're done with the game for now. Or there's a hard mode and you played the game now. Well, hard mode, you've got to play three cards every round. So are we going to move on to play three cards? Or are we just going to be like, nope, done. We beat it. <laughs> we, we, we played a complete game with two players. I, my only real interesting thing this week was I actually came in second in, uh, in our online game of tapestry, which there you go. Shocking enough to me. <laughs> I haven't seen the end of that. I assume D got first. Yeah, I, I <laughs> you messed well something up on that one. I was yeah, yeah. I I messed something up big that I misunderstood, as usual. Yeah, the, well, that's the thing with the tapestry. There's so much little stuff where it's really easy. I, there were a couple of turns where I was like going to click confirm, and I'm like, wait a second, <laughs> no, no, no. I got yeah. don't do that. I, um, again, I prefer physical for that one. Yeah, D D D. I wasn't paying attention to the center map. Um, and if I had been, I probably would have done a couple of things in different order. Yeah. Uh, Cause D was crushing everybody. Out well, everyone at the end. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and I let her cause I didn't, I wasn't paying attention to the fact that she'd been doing that. All right. Well, All how right. about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? Uh, so I need to find some time to do some unboxings. I don't even know if you have any left. Maybe you have some Aventuria stuff to put live if I don't There's get them done. There's a couple of things over there. Still. There is color. All right, so we have some stuff. I, I need to um, crack open my copy of Scythe. Um, other than that, I'm not too sure. Um, Tori and Cat aren't coming over. Hmm? Little box insert. Yeah, I should. <laughs> I, I, I got to find that. Uh, build the Clans of Caledonia box insert. That's up there. Um, Cat and Tori aren't coming over Friday. Brenda's out of town, so we're not. Uh, she's visiting Deanna's brother. Um, so I don't even know if we're going to get any in-person gaming and probably Dan and I will sit down and play something. Maybe we'll game with the kids, but like there's a lot of stuff we need to do yard work. It's that time of spring where everything's overgrown and we need to fix that. Yeah, no more um, May is over. <laughs> yes, no more May is over. Yeah, we definitely mowed, but the, it's it's the other crap that grows around our house. I hate uh, the one part of home ownership I hate. <laughs> um, so I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Um, maybe we'll sit down. No, yeah, maybe we'll sit with down with the kids and play the unlock, finish it. Although I know Brenda and Holly kind of wanted to see it, so I don't know. I, I 
Not not a lot, except I need to unbox some stuff. But not a lot of plans. And honestly, I don't know what we're reviewing next. I have no idea. Like absolutely nothing. It's not going to be side. There's no way I'm getting in five games of side by next week. So <laughs> I don't know what we're going to review. So if there's anything out there, fans, that you want us to review next Wednesday, let me know. Uh, how many games of? Oh, see, we don't. We aren't going to review that though, now, though. I was thinking the. Uh... It might. It might, might. We might do like Arnak. Because oh, okay. we haven't actually like done a formal review. That's one I bought. It's it's the uh, pile of obligation is thankfully nice and low, and I want to keep it that way. So there are two expansions for a game that we don't talk about anymore that your kids like. Oh yeah, <laughs> that we never. I'd have to play. We we haven't even finished the first. I game. know you haven't even finished the first one yet. <laughs> yes, I don't know. The the, the if I'm not going to talk about it, yeah, I don't know if we're talking about them anyway. So right, that's that's why that's part of why that hasn't happened. Yeah. All right. I don't know. Oh, that's what I should have talked about in the coffee break. We'll save that for the end show. And now, a quick shout out and thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Misdirected Mark Podcast, still talking gaming and game mastering here on Twitch every Tuesday night and on your podcatcher of choice. Ducas, thank you. Evil John, long time no talk. I'm going to have to check in with Mr. Carney. Donna, thank you. Donna, a.k.a. Pax, although you're already gone tonight. Oh, ran away. Ran away. Valentine Pache, thank you. I think that's a character from uh, Cowboy Bebop, isn't it? Well, that was the double bell. Uh, That means our shift's coming to an end. We're going to have to lock the front doors. So the doors to the lobby are closed. You can always find us across the web at tabletopbellhop.com and tabletopbellhop, one word on it as well as your podcatcher of choice under Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Show your support at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop and sign up for awesome bonus content, including hours of bonus audio and bonus entries into our latest giveaway. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us and invite you to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And... Game on.